Good morning to everybody. And uh, I first of all would like uh, to start uh, with an apology. This is Amir speaking. Uh, there was an issue with time zone synchronization between the system and what was planned, which uh, caused the error that you actually received uh, in your emails that the webinar was, uh, was supposed to start uh, one hour earlier than what was actually planned. So again, uh, my deep apologies for that. Um, with that, I would first of all want to thank those uh, who actually stayed online and uh, or rejoined uh, based on the update that we sent. And with that, I would like uh, to start. Uh, so first of all, when, uh, doing a webinar on uh, WebRTC, the first expectation I would have is actually to do the webinar using tools that are based on WebRTC. As you can see, since you have the need, you were required to download a client. This is not the case, unfortunately. Uh, actually, I did have some discussions with the provider with Citrix about this, and hopefully in the future, we will be able to have webinars that are based on WebRTC, at least for now. Uh, the systems that include all the functionalities for a webinar are not based on WebRTC. Um, in this webinar, we will have uh, Tzachil Event Levy presenting uh, most of the slides about the topic, and I will uh, have some discussions with them, ask some questions, we will have some poll questions, and try to make this as live as possible. You can also enter questions into the system uh, during the, the webinar, and we will try to answer uh, those questions along the way or at the end. Um, with that, I would like to start with a few uh, slides before uh, Tzachi begins. Uh, basically, when you are looking into uh, the, your options of uh, launching a WebRTC-based service and building the infrastructure for that service, there are two major areas of considerations that you would have. One of them is the business model, and the other one are technical considerations uh, between building or using existing solutions. When we look at the business criteria, I would say that first of all, you need to look at the nature of your business and, uh, and your customers. If you are a service provider, for example, that is uh, exposing APIs for others to build solutions based on your a service or either you're providing actually a solution to end users. Of course, there will be different choices based on that. Is this a functionality of voice and video communication just a feature in another service? For example, let's say you're providing a doctor visitation and instead of just doing it by telephone, you're now adding a feature, but there are many other things around it. That would cause a different decision versus a case that this communication is actually, this functionality is actually a core, uh, the core of your uh, service, something like a video conferencing type of solution. And of course, the business model to see if your business model can support the cost of such a system and, and uh, the requirements associated with that to actually pay per minute or per packages and uh, assuming you can actually extract that value from your customers as well. On the technical side, uh, one very important item is, uh, are you building a solution that is an island only, or maybe it needs to connect to other existing solutions, and it's not always possible to do that or to interrupt with those type of services if you're using uh, an API platform. The other, the other thing is uh, with regards to an open or closed uh, service, what uh, level of flexibility and openness from API and management perspective you need to provide to your customers and is this available in the platform? What is the, your uh, global distribution that you need versus the global distribution that the API platform has and data centers and so forth and what kind of SLA you can receive from the API platform provider? So with that, uh, without uh, further delay, I would like to uh, pass the floor over to Tzafi and let him present uh, the slides. Thank you, Amir. So what we're talking about here is essentially WebRTC and the need 
build real-time communication-based services. So we'll start by going a bit of what exactly is WebRTC, but more importantly, what exactly is missing from WebRTC, because that will mean what are the challenges that we're facing when we want to build and deploy a service. Then we'll go over the different options that we have, build versus buy. Okay, what would be the different uh, things that we would put, the requirements and the types of um, items that will make the decision either to build or to buy a solution. And then we'll go over several deployment alter alternatives that exist out there. And I want to make you acquainted with these strategies so you will have more of a, you know, a broader view of what you can do and what you can achieve. It's not an either or solution here. So let's start with, okay, let's start with what exactly is WebRTC. So put simply, WebRTC offers real-time communications that exist natively within the web browser. For web browsers that support it, it means that I can use the browser to do voice and video calls through that browser. I can do more things with WebRTC, but today this is what we will focus on. In terms of technical terms, WebRTC is simply a media engine. So media engine was something that existed before WebRTC, and this is just yet another media engine. The only difference is that it has a JavaScript API on top of it that is standardized. So now, as a web developer, you have access to a media engine that is freely available on the, inside the browser without doing anything more than sending an HTML page with some JavaScript code in that page. So how calls are made exactly in WebRTC? We've got two browsers here and some kind of a web server. So the browser sends a message to the server. That message gets sent to the other browser. Let's call it the request message. Then the other browser is going to send a response message back. And at the end of this process, what we will have is media flowing directly between the two browsers. For those who are conversant in voice over IP, SIP, or H323, this looks like a simple negotiation of a call. Now, while that is true, you need to understand that for browsers, this is brand new. The ability to send any kind of information directly between browsers without going through an intermediary, as the blue line shows, is something that was never av available before. So that's a first. This can be used for peer-to-peer -peer communications unrelated to voice and video, and it is also used for voice and video communications. What does it provide? First of all, it does it in real time. So it's low latency. It allows me to access the camera and the microphone, the speaker and the display for voice and video communications. And it also allows me to send any kind of arbitrary data that I want to send across browsers. It is browser-based, so browsers are expected to implement and support it. Today, Chrome, Firefox, and Opera already support it. Internet Explorer and Safari, that's, well, that's a different story. There is no plugins, at least in the browsers that support it. The fact that it is inside browsers doesn't mean that I can't use it elsewhere. I can wrap it into an application if I want to. I can embed it into a device. It is a secured solution. There is no option not to use security with WebRTC. All of the media runs on an encrypted SRTP channel, and it is, it is interoperable. Now, unlike voice over IP or traditional services, it's not interoperable across vendors, but across browsers. So we have four browsers that need to support interoperability, and we're going to build a single monolithic service on top of it. So why all the fuss? It's a simple media engine, nothing new there. Maybe the codecs are a bit different, but essentially we haven't changed anything. The only new concept, two new concepts that we have here, first of all, it's this is free. If you had to use a media engine two or three years ago, you would need to pay anywhere between 50,000 to 200,000 US dollars only for the license of the media engine itself. And I'm not talking about the royalties later on for using that 
uh, that piece of code in different devices and across different applications, or the royalties you need to pay for the codecs. In WebRTC, this all, co all comes free. And the second thing, which is even more important, is that the target audience for this thing, for WebRTC, isn't VoIP developers, but rather web developers. There is a change in the game. If we have, let's say, 100,000 web VoIP developers in the world, then we have millions of web developers out there. So we're enhancing the accessibility to real-time communication to a larger group of developers. So what's missing? We've got WebRTC. We can do real-time communication today in the browser. So that's it. We don't need anything more. But the truth is that there are many things that are still missing. On the client side, not all browsers support it. If you need a use case that requires you to support Internet Explorer and Safari, that someone needs to pull up, provide a plugin here to support these browsers or the ability to use Flash instead of WebRTC for these browsers. If you need mobile support, then someone needs to provide an SDK that you can wrap in an application or you need to make sure that the browser that is used in the phone is a browser that supports WebRTC, something that is today non-existent in iOS, for example. On the server side, there are many pieces that you might need and simply don't exist in WebRTC because, as we said, WebRTC is simply a media engine that sits within the browser. So things like how do you offer interoperability to legacy VoIP deployments or if you want to connect to PSTN, how do you do that? Someone needs to close that gap. There is no single signaling associated with WebRTC. So yes, you can use SIP if you want to, but it's not mandatory. You can use XMPP if you want to. You can write your own proprietary protocol, but it means that someone needs to take care of that. The signaling protocol isn't something that has been defined in WebRTC, and that's a good thing. And then all of the backend components simply don't exist. You need to go and you need to build or use them or deploy them or do whatever that is required. You need to take care of not traversal in terms of deploying stun and turn servers, you need to take care of any media stuff that you want to do. This session, for example, let's say it's done on WebRTC. It's recorded at the moment. How are you going to take care of recording with WebRTC? Someone needs to do that in the backend to receive the media through WebRTC, to store it somewhere, and then to be able to even transcode it to other codecs and other mediums to be able to play it back, not necessarily on WebRTC. So all of these are things that are missing and things that you might actually need in your specific service. If you look at the VoIP solution, and this is the way I've looked at VoIP for many years now, these are the types of things that you will see in the anatomy of VoIP. There is the codec and the media processing. The codecs are H.264, VP8, AMR, whatever it is, voice and video codecs. These are the parts that take the analog data and the captures from the microphone and the camera, okay, they convert them to something digital, they compress them, and then on the other side, they decompress them and then display them or uh, play them back. Media processing on top of that takes care of sending these things on the network and taking care of the fact that the networks are not um, that you can lose packets on the, on the network. They're not reliable in, in their nature. So someone needs to do media processing. On top of that, there is the signaling. How am I going to reach out to that other person that I want to talk to, to communicate with? And then there's the infrastructure. What are the building blocks that I have in the back end? How is my system architected and deployed? WebRTC takes care of only two things. It takes care of the codec. Sachi, something happened to your voice.
Hello? Hear you. Okay, I'm back. I'm sorry I dropped, I haven't got a clue why. So, as I said, WebRTC takes the part of Codex and Binger processing. It leaves the signaling out of scope for you to use whatever it is you want to use for it and leaves the infrastructure off. So again, you need to decide whatever it is that you want to do there. Amir, can you give me control? Okay. So we need to remember one thing. There is an inherent tension here with WebRTC. It takes two separate worlds and connect them. First one is the RTC part, real-time communications. For those who come from that world, they know how to do voice over IP. And there are ways to build voice over IP solutions. And then there is the web, how you build stuff for the internet. Totally different types of solutions, totally different types of paradigms. And it's not really apparent which ones you should go and use. And it depends from which part of this um, pulling rope game you come um, that will define what exactly it is that you will think and the way you will react and respond to things that you need to do with WebRTC. So now that you know exactly what WebRTC is and what the challenges are there, let's go and see how do we go about choosing uh, between building and buying, okay, the service that we want to build. And I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs that have ideas and they want to go and create them and build them, develop them. And usually it boils down to, the, to this. What are the requirements that you have, okay? Do you have a solution that needs only voice? Or do you need only also video? Is there any messaging involved other than voice and video? Are things done also asynchronously? Do we need to support multipoint interactions? Look at this webinar, for example. In this webinar, it's me and Amir talking, so it's point to point, but it gets broadcasted to a larger audience of people. Do you need to support mobile devices, recording? Do you need any storage capabilities? to come along with it. So there are a lot of different requirements that might belong to the use case that you have in mind. And you need to go and write down exactly what the requirements are and take into account also the fact that you need to look at the uh, MVP part, the minimal viable product, okay? What would be the basic service that you want to launch? And also in your roadmap, what you would want to do next? So I might say, well, I want to build a messaging solution that does voice today, voice interactions, and I know that one or two years down the road, I would not want to introduce video as well. And that would reflect some of the uh, things that I would need to decide about. More important than that, though, is the pedigree. Where do you come from? What are your experiences with voice over IP? Are you coming from the domain of web or voice over IP? Okay. I come from a voice over IP pedigree. I've worked at Radvision for 13 years before leaving that company. I've done a lot of things with signaling, voice, and video. So I know to speak the language. I know people in that industry. Industry. I know developers that I can go and hire. I know how to talk to them. I know how a project of voice over IP looks like. Okay, so this is one thing. If I come from web, then there are other things, other capabilities that I have, but I might not be able to speak the word, the language of voice over IP. And the second part, and the more important one, is what is the use case that you have in mind? What do I mean? I talk to uh, people that have built a telehealth solution where they want to provide the psychiatry, uh, psychiatric um, sessions online via video using WebRTC. And the thing is that none of them was a VoIP developer. They all came with backgrounds as being doctors. So they said, we know the industry. We know the business processes in this industry. We know all the legal requirements that we need to go through. We know the buying decision and who is going to buy the system? Do you sell it to the people that go to the psychiatrist? Do you sell this to the psychiatrist? Or do you end up selling these to hospitals or to insurance companies? 
So I know the use case better than anyone else. I know the premise of that use case. So that's going to be my core competency or my core value that I bring to the table. Okay, so this is very important, understanding where you are coming from. <clears throat> it is doubly important because you need to look at the availability of people that you can hire. I did a search on, on LinkedIn for these keywords, WebRTC, RTP, SIP, and Voice over IP. For WebRTC, there are less than 3,000 people that indicated that in their profile somewhere. <clears throat> if you're looking for someone conversant in SIP, you've got over 200,000, and voice over IP, that's 800,000 people. Okay, so if I need to hire someone that knows WebRTC, this is going to be tough. Either I know them beforehand, or I know people that can grow into these positions, okay? I need to make sure that I have the available employees in place if I want to go for the build option and not buy. Another point of view is the point of view of the innovator's dilemma. Okay, we've got the low end and the time end, the high end of the product performance that our customers are going to expect, and there is the passage of time. And the technologies that exist today, okay, the legacy technologies progress. Okay, and they do that because of sustaining technologies. We know that the TCPUs are going to get better, the networks are going to have more bandwidth, and we know that the developers are doing A, B, and C, and they have these kinds of capabilities. We know these things, and we know that they improve with time. And that improvement means that we're going to support the high end a lot better through time as well. And then comes the disruptive technology and it comes from the low end, so it doesn't affect anyone in the high end part, and through time it's going to surpass the high end because it is disruptive. And the question is, where are we? And if you look at WebRTC, this is where it is. It is a disruptive technology, it isn't suitable today for the high end yet, but it is good enough for many different use cases. And the question is, is media communications basic and a core competency today and can you differentiate with it at all or is it something of a let's, let's call it a commodity for lack of a better word is this simply something that I need to have there but I don't really care because the end solution is going to be good enough in that specific area and last thing is the era of monetization how am I going to make money from the use case that I'm building and there are four ways to make money today. First one is to sell tools for someone else to build stuff with. So I'm going to build an API platform. I'm going to solve a specific gap in WebRTC and let others make money on top of that from a real use case that goes to consumers. I can decide that I'm going to sell to enterprises or to a unified communication solutions. Okay. An interesting option, but there are a lot of solutions out there today. So this is a crowded space. I can go to consumer messaging, very hot space these days, a lot of companies going in with different modalities of how to communicate, interesting to be there. Most of them are still not making money or making money from making messaging platforms into e-commerce platforms or simply by being acquired. And the last option is by adding context, by taking a specific use case like the doctor's use case that I said earlier and saying I'm not going to pay for the communication but rather for the context I'm going to send for pay for the psychologist a lot of money to have that specific session and part of it is going to go for the communication but because this is the part that enables me to talk to a psychologist and now we get to a poll question Amir Thank you, Tzachi. I think it's time now to uh, get the audience uh, involved. So I'm going to put on a, a poll question, poll question and uh, would be happy to get your uh, feedback and answers on this. So you should be able to see it on your screen uh, just now. And uh, while the audience is answering, Tzachi, maybe it uh, will be interesting to hear from you a little bit, I think that one of the major uh, risks that people uh, view when they think of 
using an API platform versus building it themselves uh, is the risk of a vendor lock. So can you talk a little bit about this and uh, what do you see as uh, mitigation options for it? Okay, I'll answer that in a second. I just want to go over the poll question itself because this is also an interesting one. It goes to the vendor locking as part of the decision process. But essentially, there are different cases where you would choose uh, to use an API platform. And, and the question is, if you look at the vendor locking part, uh, it really depends. Yes, you are locking yourself to, to a specific vendor, but you are reducing so much of the work and effort that you need to do that it makes a lot of sense in many cases. If you look, for example, in the uh, startup, sorry? We hear you. Please okay. Go Okay, if you look today at, at, at uh, the startup market, most most entrepreneurs cannot uh, go and get money and get seed funding before they show a demo of the solution working. And to get there fast means going and using an API platform instead of building it on your own. Okay, it takes you a lot less resources and less time. So until you can show a proof of concept or even a first application running with real customers using it, using an API platform makes the most sense. Uh, there is predictability with an API platform. Yes, again, you lock yourself to a vendor, but you can switch to another one because there are a lot of platforms out there. There, there is an investment involved, but you can build or design the solution in a way that, doesn't, that reduces this vendor locking uh, concept. Okay. Uh, there is a funny thing that goes on as well, uh, just an anecdote. Okay, we have Twilio, one of the large telco API platforms out there that provides communications, and then there are other API platforms that simply say the APIs that we give are Twilio APIs. They are the same APIs, so you can switch to us and switch back to them if you want to. Our pricing is lower, our service is better. So it's more dynamic than that saying, well, there's vendor locking and I can't leave that vendor. Okay, um, we have results and uh, let's show it uh, on the screen to everybody. Uh, you should be able to see it now. Uh, actually, we have uh, the same uh, number of uh, people who voted for, uh, when, uh, for option number two and option number three. Do you wanna talk about this a little bit? Yes, I think that an API platform for me is a platform that always white labels. Okay, it's not as if I'm going to say, well, I'm going to use Google Hangouts for my service and I'm going to let people go and do that on Google Hangouts or on Skype. For me, an API platform, it's not just saying there are APIs for Google Hangouts. It's that the platform, the API platform itself, it's, is not built to be the front of the service. As an example, if you again look at Twilio, one of their larger, larger customers are either uh, Zendesk or uh, LiveOps, okay, both in the CRM space. Nobody knows that they use Twilio unless you go and dig deep into whatever it is on the, their press releases of what they're using and why. But at the end of the day, an API platform is white labeled in, in its DNA, in its core. Okay. Um, I think I can relate very nicely to the second option of uh, core feature versus, uh, uh, you know, the essence of my service. That's true, but a lot of people sometimes actually mistake what's core and what's not in the solution that they want to build. Okay, you go to a company, they say, we want to, I don't know, I want to redefine the collaboration market. Okay, that's nice, but does doing collaboration better than someone else, than WebEx or than GoToWebinar means doing voice and video better? Or does it mean providing annotation capabilities a lot better or making the user experience better? That doesn't usually relate to the video communication part. Okay. Okay, so defining exactly what, what it means, the core feature in your service is very important. Sure. Okay. Um, I'll uh, 
give you one a question from the audience. You don't have to take it right now, but I think, uh, I think it will be related very nicely to the slides uh, in the next part of the presentation. So uh, keep it in mind. Uh, the question is actually related, I believe, to the slide you showed about the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, voice and video uh, that goes between the browsers. And the question was, uh, what about an, uh, enabling uh, sessions also through a media server to do, you know, things like conferencing, uh, recording, as you mentioned, and others. So I believe you'll be able to touch that in the following slides. So I think with that, let's go to, okay. the, to the next part of the presentation. Yes, this again goes to the build versus buy. Put the presentation out so I can continue. But essentially, uh, think about it this way. You've written down your requirements. So you know exactly what it is that you want to build. You know your pedigree. You know your capabilities. You know that you will need a back-end recording system, or you know that you need to support multipoint. And you know what level of multipoint you want to reach. Are these only four people, consumers that are on a freemium service and they're not worth your time and effort in terms of hosting something in the back end that consumes a lot of bandwidth and CPU? Or are they paying customers that expect the best quality in terms of video, latencies, whatever? Okay? So this goes in, comes into play as well. And there are different strategies that you can go through and they're not necessarily the same. So, the alternative starts from the dependency level of dependency that you either want or are going to get from using third parties and the level of required experience in VoIP and WebRTC that you will need. And that also translates to effort, resources, budget, timeline, okay? So you can start by saying, I'm going to self-develop everything, or you can decide to integrate open source frameworks instead of doing self-development for everything, okay? There is a part of, I'm going to use commercial SDKs and frameworks. It's not going to be open source. And I'm going to do that either because they give me a better experience or because I need that support or because they give me an SLA or they comfort me in terms of what I can do. If I give an example, I, when you work at a large company that is a global company, the decision of going to a commercial service or a commercial SDK or framework and not to an open source one lies on the fact that you are going to need support and you're going to need it now and you need a throw to choke when you get there. So it might be the fact that I'm a large, a large enterprise, okay, that is multinational and I can't use open source for such a thing. So that goes into the decision processing. Process, uh, processes that I'm going to have. You can then go and say, well, I'm going to employ SaaS. I'm not going to do uh, the deployments and the management on my own. I'm going to use software as a service for specific components, not for everything. Or you can go the whole way and say, well, I'm going to use an API platform. Everything that relates to the real-time communication part is going to be delegated to an API platform that will take all the work from me and this is what they are going to do. And if we start from the frameworks, if you're a developer and you want to dirty your hands, then you can use frameworks. There are many frameworks out there. The most popular ones are these. Okay, Simple WebRTC. Simple WebRTC has a web pedigree. It, it's a framework that comes from a company called Endyet in Portland. And what this company does on a daily basis is build JavaScript-based web applications for their customers. This solution is technically sound and it can easily be used and extended to other areas. So if you have a service that you need something that provides the basic signaling, uh, mesh multipoint support, not a lot of media stuff inside it, then Simple WebRTC is a very good choice. Another option is to go to PeerJS. PeerJS, again, comes from the web. It's a very short JavaScript uh, code that runs on Node.js, backend uh, signaling service, okay? And the people that use web PeerJS usually are those that need something that is simple and lightweight, and mostly will use a data channel. You will want less voice and video communication and more messaging type of solution. 
the ability to communicate across browsers directly. These are the types of uh, services that I've seen being written on top of PeerJS. The third widely known uh, framework is EasyRTC. It comes from a, comp a project company called Prologic in Canada, and they are very known in the market with a lot of servers deployed on top of EasyRTC. Again, voice and video communications is done using EasyRTC. The thing that is interesting with all of these three frameworks is that all of them use Node.js. And Node.js is a backend, backend framework for writing um, network intensive applications, which suits very well into WebRTC. Um, so this is why a lot of the frameworks that you will see out there are Node.js based, and the people that know and are happy with using uh, Node.js will usually be people that come from the web side of the house, not from the voice over IP side. So if you come from the internet and have internet developers, these frameworks are probably the ones that are most suitable for you, and you probably need someone that knows how to develop using Node.js. Next, we have the SDKs. Everyone is going to need a turn server. There are several turn servers out there that can support WebRTC. But the most common and known one that people are using are, is called RFC 5766 Turn Server. It's again an open source uh, server. You can go download, install it wherever you want. Uh, in the WebRTC Weekly that is going to be released today, there is also a link there uh, to an explanation that was published on a blog last night about how to uh, install the, and uh, configure a turn, this specific Turn Server on AWS EC2, EC okay, on Amazon Web Services, if you want to deploy it there. If you come from the voice over IP pedigree, then what you're going to look for is SIP solutions. And there, on the server side, you have Asterix, FreeSwitch, and Camellio already supporting WebRTC, or SIP over, over WebSockets, that includes WebRTC. And there is also the client side that goes into the browser. So a JavaScript client that you can run on the browser, and there are many of them, SIP.js, JSSIP, CoffeeSIP, SIPML, and a few others. So again, just choose whatever you like or whatever comes with the PBX that you're going to use. Try them out and see what works for you. Next, there is the media service. If you need things to be done on the media side, then you're going to need some kind of media processing. You can go for the commercial side of the story, okay, like taking the Power Media XMS uh, server from Dialogic and licensing that from them, or get the ga GenBand gateway called Spider if you need to gateway WebRTC into the PSTN world. And then there are open source solutions as well, like the GT Video Bridge that I've seen being deployed a lot lately, or the Anus gateway that is a generic gateway that you can use to connect to whatever it is that you want to uh, connect it to. There are additional media servers as well. Okay, Curento was another one that I was acquainted with about a month or two ago. So a lot of options here for developers. The next option we have is services. I want to deploy software as a service. I want to delegate parts of what I do to someone else. So let's say I want a signaling solution and I don't want to start building the servers for it and deploying them and thinking about their scalability and where I'm, I'm going to locate them and manage them in real time to see what happens and monitor. I can go to companies that provide messaging and signaling as a service like PubNub and Firebase. These two companies, for example, also uh, took another step. Besides doing signaling, they provide some reference code to how to integrate that with WebRTC. And you can use that. It gives you predictability. You know what the price is going to be per month, per authority that you're going to do. Second option is saying, well, I want to take that traversal out of, out of the equation. I'm doing stuff in the web. I am clueless about media. I need that traversal. I don't know how to do it, how to configure it. I don't want to deal with it. So what we're going to do is find a service that provides you only that. Xerces is one of the companies that do that. So you can go to Xerces, pay them as you go, and use their server. Simply com configure their servers in your WebRTC code. So here with Xerces, for example, 
there will be very little vendor lock-in. And then if you want to say, well, I want multi-point support. I want to do it server-side. I want to be able to scale it to 10 or 20 people in the same uh, meeting room, whatever. There is a software as a service solution for that as well from a company called, I think, MNS Media Network Services or Solutions. And they have a service called mcu1.com. You can go there, buy their service, and then you have an MCU that many people can join into a specific uh, session together. From there, you can jump into the API platform space. And there are a lot of different API vendors out there, a lot more than one, each one giving different types of capabilities. Uh, some of them focus on video, some of them only on voice, some of them enable connectivity to PSTN, others don't. They have different types of SDKs, different type of fallback when you go and look at Internet Explorer and Safari, and different capabilities. Recording, text-to-speech, all of these types of uh, enabling capabilities exist in some of them. And there is room for all of them today. Um, as you can see, for example, Aid Live here is uh, grayed out because they got acquired by Snapchat and that's going to be one of the other issues. These API platforms are also up for acquisitions. They can be acquired and taken out of market like AdLive or they can be acquired and become a more solid vendor like Talkbox that got acquired by Telefonica a year ago. And it's not clear what is going to happen but I should add that this is the case with any vendor that you are going to use and with any software as a service platform that you are going to use. And as the world is transitioning into cloud, this is a problem that is going to stay with us for a long time and not only in WebRTC and with API platforms. Sachi, uh, before you go on, I want to uh, mm -hmm. bug you a little bit here with a few questions. Um, starting first of all with the SAS, uh, the previous slide, uh, that uh, we went through. Maybe I'll go back to that for just a second. Um, how do you see the ability to actually switch between vendors and the level of uh, connectivity uh, or interchangeable that between them? I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's say uh, I'm using an MCU for a conferencing or I'm, I'm using a media server for some uh, transcoding capabilities. To what level are these interfaces going to be standard uh, based on your experience and what you uh, discussed with those companies and to what level it's proprietary? Also on the signaling side, what is my ability to decide I want to change? I understand for NAT reversal there it's probably, the, I think, the simplest option for, for switching in case I need to. But for the, uh, the first and the last one, it's, I think, a more bigger challenge. So they're all proprietary even the Xerxes one. And they are proprietary because at the end of the day, when you need to switch, you're going to leave behind a lot of benefits and values that these companies bring or these services bring that might not be available in the next one or in what we're going to develop on your own. And I want to touch on the Xerxes one a lot better, a lot more, okay, a bit more. You go to Xerxes, you say, well, this is only a turn service. I'm going to use turn. I'm going to, I can switch to anyone else. No change. The only thing I need to change in my code is the DNS name of the server that I'm going to use and the user and password. So it sounds like there is no vendor locking, right? But if you look at, look at Xerxes, they are also offering you back-end service that enables you to see exactly who is online and where are calls going through the world today or around the globe. They can provide you, if they want, a monthly uh, report they can provide you analytics of what is your growth in terms of, look, you paid for us this month, I don't know, $1,000. Next month is going to be 1200 because we've looked at the trend of how your uh, customers are using the system. And by looking at the last six months, we see these growth coming up. Now, if you are going to say, well, I'm going to switch, you might not get these additional benefits and, and features. And you're not going to develop them on your own because there are going to be extra effort. You, it's just, so these benefits are not going to be there. And for a company like Sirsis, 
this is going to be top priority because this is their way of locking you in. They're not doing that by having an API that is proprietary. They're doing that by differentiating the service that they provide in the back end on top of it. Okay, so for me, going to Xersys or going to PubNub, whereas PubNub has a proprietary API, is no different. You have the, almost the same vendor lock-in. At the oh. end of the day, you're going to be locked to a vendor. Okay. How much is the switching cost? It depends on how much you rely on them. Yeah, well, there is a big difference so. between vendor lock-in because of uh, reporting and capabilities like that versus the API. And maybe let's go to the, to the next slide about uh, the API platforms. I know that you looked really deeply into the APIs of each one of the vendors that we have here. Can you shed some light mm -hmm. on what do you think uh, is, let's say, the time uh, you would estimate it would take uh, you know, experienced developers to integrate such a, a platform for a basic uh, voice video call? And do you see big differences between the vendors from the flexibility level and, verse, and based on that complexity? So for the basic stuff, it's, it's usually in terms of weeks. That would be, you know, that's how much time you actually need to do something basic. So switching between them is going to take weeks as well, not more than that. And I've seen companies that switch between vendors already. I've talked to a few of them and understood why and the reason they had behind it. They usually start with one vendor, they are happy, but not that much, and they want something a bit different, so they switch. And it happens. So you might end up saying, well, I'm going to try something out, and then I might need to move, or even if it, it doesn't get acquired, it just doesn't bring me the value that I need, then you switch. So that's one. The second thing is that they don't offer the same service. If I go to Twilio, it means that I'm going for the long tail. Okay, there is very little interaction that I need to do with Twilio in order to start using their service. Everything is self-service. I can play with it and I can start by paying nothing and then start paying $20 or something like that until I bring the service up to market. If you go for Temasys, then you need to talk to them. You need to explain to them why you should be their customer because they don't have self-service yet. If you go to Cafe X, they do only on-premise. So that's a totally different ball game. So it really depends what it is that you're looking for. Uh, with Twilio, Wemo, Talkbox, API Days, what you get is, I'd say, you get bare bone. You get the ability to control the low-level stuff. And this is what you're looking for. But if you go to Request Tech, you're going to get widgets that are be based on building a HIPAA-compliant a application for the telehealth market with ready-made widgets that allows you to do chat and chat rooms and things like that. So you get higher level exposure of the APIs, but a lot less flexibility. Okay, so switching between them can be hard. It can be easy. It really depends on what it is that you're looking for. Okay, let's, uh, let's continue. Okay. So... Here are the current recommendations that I have for you. First of all, define the core team that you are going to have and the core capabilities that they have. What do you have? Voice or IT developers, or are you someone that comes from the business side and you are now searching for a CTO to build your service? Totally different areas and totally different attractiveness to developers. Are you come from the internet? Okay, are you deploying a social network and you want to add WebRTC to that or voice capabilities to that? Again, different ball game. Then define what your MVP is, what your minimal viable product is, and what are the future features that you are going to need. They might be simple, they might be complex. If they are complex, go for an API platform. Decide on the weight that you have for your KPIs, the key performance indicators that you need. What would define your success or the things that you must have in a platform? You might say, well, I need the solution to be deployed in my target market and my target market is going to be Africa. True story. And I'm going to tell you now that none of the API platforms out there have any data center in Africa. And there's a lot of issues with 
broadband in Africa, so you might need to build and deploy everything on your own there. So this is going to be a real issue, a real KPI, the geography uh, that these API platforms are located at or what they serve. And then go and search for their platforms that fit these requirements that you have. There are about 20 different Telco API platforms that support WebRTC today. Search for the platforms that have the best fit, go to two or three of them and try them out. Onboard the, their system, look at the documentation that they have, build a rudimentary sample code there in one or two days and then have your developers give the feedback and do the decisions on what's best for them. And this is a process that I see many companies go through. Okay, so this is how you select a platform and it also applies to how you select if you're going to use a platform or build it on your own. You need to understand the KPIs, the core capabilities, the features that you're looking for, and what frameworks or platforms you're going to use to build that. Now, we've got another poll coming up right next to the end. Okay, so um, the next poll that you have uh, is now, uh, you should be able to see that uh, online right now, what development alternative best fits your needs. So I think we... Yes, this goes through. I think we pretty much wetch, went, pretty much went uh, into, into that through your slides. But any more comments that you have? No, just that I'd like to, you know, to see the results because it, it gives some kind of an understanding who is the audience and what are their, their thought processes, which for me, it's, it's very interesting. Okay, uh, I think we have pretty strong answers. We'll just give it another minute or two for uh, because I still see people voting, so... Uh, They're all going to self-develop it. <laughs> well, I won't tell you what's the answer yet. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, it's uh, an interesting one, that's for sure. Uh, okay, I think we can... Uh, okay, if anyone wants to vote, please do now. I see a few more adding right now. Uh, because we have seven minutes to go. So I think we can close the poll now and let's see the results okay so they're going to use open source or apis okay i would say that the second option of open source and commercial components go very well with sas components for example i would go and use simple webrtc or easy rtc framework in parallel with using series for natraversal instead of deploying the natraversal myself i would even you can mix and mix and match these 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 different options yeah that was pretty much what i was relating to when i spoke about the SaaS and the ability to actually mix and match uh, between different solutions uh there was another mm -hmm. question uh, from the audience i just want to give the answer the question was what is a kpi kpi is key performance indicator uh i think we can uh, continue to the uh, end of the presentation so please uh yeah end. The presentation, Emil? Yeah, I'll uh, remove the results. Okay, so this is the ob obligatory self-promotion. If you need more, then I do consulting. And more than that, there is a report, an online report that is available on my website. It talks about what exactly is WebRTC in more detail, the challenges of developing with WebRTC, what are the gaps that are there, what are the available WebRTC development options that we have? We have went through that in the second part of this presentation. And then there is a detailed view about the different KPIs for selecting a platform and an overview of 13 of these platforms. So you can go online and get that report. And with that, I don't have, I want to, Thank you for joining, and if there are, Amir, if you see any more questions, I would be happy to take them now. Okay, thank you very much, Tachi, and uh, I want to thank everybody uh, who was online as well. Uh, apologize again for the misunderstanding and the issue that we had, uh, and that was uh, the first uh, webinar in a series of webinars that we were planning on doing, and I think that uh, 
was a good lesson for us from uh, the system uh, management perspective and so forth. And uh, hopefully it will not happen again. Anyway, this webinar will be available. Uh, the recording of the webinar will be available. And uh, I know there are some people who actually sent me a question for asking for the recording link and you will get that through an email. We will also send you uh, a very, very short survey just to get your feedback uh, on the content of the webinar. So thank you everybody and thank you Tzachi. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.